my views on game in this country is that we've got to stop living in the past. So you, you can't have tradition. You can't have tradition and change. You've got to let go. You've got to let go of one and got to grow another thing. So if you want change and want that game to keep the pace, you've got to get rid of promotion relegation. You've got to understand um, how we develop teams in, in key areas. And that's not losing other teams, but recognising again that the game's not strong enough to be on the old model of having three divisions. If you're no good in the top division, you go into the second division. If you're no good in the second division, you go into the third. If you're good in the third, you go into the second. That doesn't work because of the way money flows and the way that kids play sport nowadays. Well, to be fair, you don't look any older. It's because some people in rugby league don't look at the finish plane and they look horrendous. So you've, you've done well to keep I, uh, it up. Those, uh, those, yeah, those old old boys, I remember when I first started, it was like you'd look around and it seemed like these blokes were like, must have been in their 80s and they were like in their early, late 20s, early 30s. But most of them still had full time jobs. Most of them had done, like hard jobs. And then they were getting beaten up every weekend. <laughs> so that can age quite local. quickly. In, in the local rugby club, if you walk in, there's people walking around who've got bad knees, bad backs. And like you say, some of them you think, how old are they? They could pass for 60, th- just late 30s. Just I think it was long. one of those kind of things. Well, everybody's playing a little bit longer now just because of a little bit of science. The game's got quicker and it's, it's a completely different game to the game that was played six years ago, never mind 40 years ago. Or, and it's down to science. It's just down to a little bit of understanding and... Like I say, players are playing a little bit longer, staying healthier. I like say you do, you have a knee operation um, in the eighties or seventies, and you won't play again. You have a knee operation, you're playing in six weeks now. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. still, and you're being looked after. And then players are coming out with a better understanding. I like to say we're having, we're having some mental health issue problems with lots of people, but not just sportsmen. But when you look at, like, they, they've got a better understanding of their bodies. So when they finish. They're looking at themselves a little bit better. They're staying, ex- just carrying on exercising. They're not drinking as much, or they're not drinking because, as much because they didn't drink as much when they played. So they're having a little bit of more longevity with the tool that they've got, which is their body. And I think that's what you're seeing now. So that, my, my for my part, like saying yeah, I've got at about what, what about eight or nine oper- major operations from knee reconstruction, shoulder reconstruction, ankles, elbows. Snap collarbones, broken face, deep bones, nose. And if I don't stay active and I don't do stuff, like I say, it's really hard to keep going. It's like I get sore really quickly, joints stiffen up, a little bit of arthritis in certain places. I mean, the cold weather, there. isn't it? The cold weather is horrendous, well, isn't it? Any operation think, you've had when it's cold, you feel it. Yeah, but and more my, my back, and it's one of those kind of things where now and every like I say, I've got a palsy disc in my neck. And if I don't, I don't want operations anymore. I've had enough of those. So it's about staying active, about working out what's best for you and staying staying as active as possible. Keep moving. That's my, my philosophy now is like, it's not about training too hard, but I, I like to train, but it's just move. Just keep moving. Do something and move. I, I, how old were you when you, you got into rugby? Because I read somewhere that you grew up in Salford. Were you a young lad when you got into rugby or were you just playing all sports and no, you were best no, at rugby? No, I was playing that. My 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 journey is quite. Uh, I don't think it's unique. I think you see it along the way with lots of kids. But my journey started off like playing football when when I was 11 years of age. I played for Salford Schoolboys and I played at Wembley in 1982. So I played at Wembley as curtain raiser, and I'd never played rugby. I didn't know what rugby league was at 11. But some, for some reason, Salford's application got pushed forward. It was their turn on the roster. We had a trial. I went from my local primary school to this trial. I was a quick kid, quick strong kid, played a lot of football. And I got picked to play in the Salford side that we played at Wembley against um, a Castleford side. And we got we got beat quite easily because most of the lads that played in that Salford side didn't really play rugby. Yeah. And I, I came out of that and we'd spent a great weekend down there. The 1982 side game was Andy Gregg had played in it. So Andy Gregg ended up playing, it was playing in that game as a, as a Young, t- a young, um, a young man, and I, I ended up watching the game, enjoying the game. Came out of that, and then see a rugby ball again for about another couple of years. I didn't really have any interest in rugby at all until I was about thirteen, and then at thirteen again, I um, I got put on a trial through school to go and play for 
uh, Lancashire. So it was the Lancashire Yorkshire Trail. But I was in the, in the 80s, the early 80s, there was a lot of school strikes. So there was no extracurricular stuff after school. Nothing was going on. So you didn't have sports after school. You didn't have sports in school. I just had PE lessons. In the middle of Salford, I grew up in a school called Clarendon Park High. I didn't have a sports field. I had to get on a bus, drive 20 minutes to a field, have a 25-minute session, get back on the bus, come back and go back to school. So it wasn't like sport was something that was yeah. highly um, visible. But we had sports halls and a couple of good sports te- teachers. But like sport was just something I did outside. I'd run around, chase things, but football... Street football was my thing as well, and the local five side team called Clown Clown and Clown and Juniors. So I played for those, and it was well, education wasn't on my high list. It was just at that time. School was strike, and I, again, sports teacher comes up. There's a Salford boys. Salford, there's a um, there's a trial for Lancashire rugby. I think you'd be good at rugby. A fellow called John Stainton, um, sports teacher, and I went along. I didn't even have any boots. Right. Uh, I, I only had, like, we played on gravel. So I, did, I only played in trainers. Uh, played football on gravel at a local, like, a local rec. So I didn't have any um, any boots. So I borrowed some boots and I trained. I got picked to play for Lancashire. Again, it was, I just had good athletic ability. I, I was quick and I was quite tall for my age big. I was skinny. Skinny run to the thing then. And... I ended up playing for Lancashire against Yorkshire. We won the game, which was in, I think it was in, played in White Table. I might have been played in White Table or something like that, this local game. And there was a gentleman called Kevin Devine. His two sons played, ended up playing professionally. And he'd run a side called Lee Rangers. So I'm from Salford. He runs, he's part of the team, he's part of the Lee Rangers set up. And he'd just come over and ask me if I'd like to go and play for his team and I said I can't I can't I can't make it um, my mum I'm a single parent family my mum doesn't drive and I've got no way of getting there and he basically said don't worry about that I'll come and get you right and he used to drive and Lee at that stage I'd say at the moment it's like it's 20 miles 25 miles away from where I was less than that straight down the East Lancashire Road the A580 to it felt like it was the other side of the world when I was 14, 13. I mean, like, but this fella came Sunday mornings, picked me up, drove me to Lee or wherever the team was playing, like, say, Warrington or Wigan or wherever we were playing. He picked me up, he took me there. I played. I got in the car, didn't have a shower, got back in the car. He took me home. I didn't see him until the following Sunday. That went on until I was 16. I never trained. Never did any nice. training with Lee or so. When you look at a talent ID and um, pathways of identification and pathways and upskilling kids, I never trained as a rugby player. Never did any training. I played football. I played football all the way through. I was quite a good school boy football. I played for Salford um, under 15s, under 16s. I was a Manchester United school boy. I was on the the books of Manchester United up to 16, and I got offered a YTS at. Um, Old Trafford at Manchester United. A lad called Matt Robbins, who is the same age as I am, who ended up going on and scoring a goal in a FA Cup game that supposedly saved Alex Ferguson's job. He was he played older boys the same age as me, and he got he got the um, apprenticeship um, at the time when he was sixteen. And I was at that stage had gone on and played for England schoolboys rugby league. Um, but football was where my main driver was. I, I thought I was gonna, I thought I was gonna go and play for Manchester United. It was one of those sing, single-minded dreams. I got picked up with a couple of the clubs after Port Vale and Blackburn offered me YTS and apprenticeships. And the scheme's pretty complicated. The apprenticeship scheme in football was pretty complicated. It's only fifteen a year, and but half of those are second years, half of those are first years before you get offered a full-time professional contract. And those that those days it was something like thirty two quid a week. It wasn't yeah. like it's it was about you wanted to be a professional sportsman. There's no education pathway, and I lost the match. I got a 
I, I, I wish I still had it. My mum passed away a number of years ago now and I've lost some stuff. I had a letter from Manchester United telling me they weren't willing to offer me the apprenticeship. She kept told of that. But at the time, again, I've, I've been playing for English schools rugby. Not really, but I've just been to trials, played for Lancashire, played for uh, a couple of trial games, got picked and played on a tour for English schools. The, the league team I played with, Lee Rangers, was a great team. We didn't lose for a couple of years. I had lads called I had Ian Gildar, um, Sean Tyra, um, Sean Devine. They all went on and played professional, professional rugby. Like Ian Gildar went and signed for uh, Wigan with me at the same time. And I got offered to come down and speak to the board at, at Wigan. 16 years of age. I sc- I'd been scouted by a fella called Derek Standish. And it was just an invite. So I got my mum came along again. My dad was around at the moment at that time. It just it, it, it came in and out of my life, ironically. And he was around at that time. And he came down, he came down to the to the meeting. So we said we went down, like I say, it's quite vivid now. Like you're thinking back. I turned up, I had my England schoolboys tie on, my England schoolboys blazer, and went up to the boardroom at Wigan and the old boardroom with big desk and it was the old style stuff you got the board members sat at the back sandwiches on the table Tom Rathbone's got a massive cigar and he's got a brandy in front of him Jack Hilton's there the, um, Morris Linder um, Jack Robinson and they're sat on this board behind them they're all leaning forward and they've obviously I've done this has been going all night like say they're sort of talking and we'd like to sign you some so I'm sat there with my mum my dad, my mum's dressed like she's going a night out. She's never been a night out in his life. Yeah. So she's fully done. <laughs> I said, that seems like a big do when you're 16 years of age. And so I'm sat there and they offered, they talked to me and he said, we want to offer your son a contract. Uh, this is what I said, it's, we'll, we'll give you now, we'll give him five and a half thousand pounds tonight. So this was 1986. I lived in a council house in the middle of Salford. My mum did about four jobs. So I, I then my dad wasn't around a lot and I never never heard that kind of money five and a half thousand quid and it was like eyes open but I was due to go to see Lee and I was going to go to see Lee so in fact this couple of scouts that had been around so I was kind of thinking oh great brilliant and I know the other lads like because I'd like to talk I know Ian Gildart had been offered something similar a lad called Wayne Reed who went on to play for Wigan who played for the amateur St. Pat's who played for the school boys I know that he'd been offered something similar and so I knew where it was. And this contract was an open-ended contract. So when he signed a contract then at 16, well, it didn't have any term on it. It was no like one year, two year, three years. It was, we'll give you a sum of money. If you play in the first team, you'll get so much for 10 games, so much for 20 games. If you play yeah. for the uh, Great Britain Colts, but there was no end to it. He signed it and basically I could still be on that contract now. <laughs> it, was yeah. like, it, was, it was just, it sounded great at the time, but it was a no end no long-term contract. It just had lots of little, lots of money in that. That, like, say, one thousand, two thousand, three thousand, five hundred money that I'd never even heard of, ever considered, never seen. So it felt like, oh my god! In reality, it was like it was a myth. The money wasn't real. It was like it was going to take me at least three or four years to earn some of it, and some of it they wanted to give me now. But they off made the offer. Like I said, it's, I'm going on a little bit. They made the offer to me, it's five and a half thousand. And they left the room and said, well, let you ever think about it. See what you want to do, but we'd like to sign your son. I think he's got a future here. We like the way he plays and blah, blah, blah. So I'm sat there that. And that, but like the, I say, my dad wasn't around. He was around, but he wasn't around. He was violent. He was a violent man. Um, but him and my mum had this strange relationship that those kind of people do at that, at that time. Like I said, from, he was from a, broken home in a way and when you look back he wasn't a nice bloke and he never was like say but he, he had work and he came in and out of my life and at this stage he was just there he come back and decided that he was in in my life and he was um, he, he gave me the best piece of advice ever though like so we sat there we made the offer he leans across to me puts his head quite close to mine and he said fucking sign it <laughs> and that was the only <laughs> That was the only piece of advice they ever given me that had been worthwhile. So that there was none like, oh, you can do this, we'll talk about that. All he could see was five and a half thousand quid. And so I signed a contract with Wigan and I became a professional rugby league player at 16 years of age. 
the, the money turns you though, know, doesn't nice. it? Because it, 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 I was the same as you. I was from like a council house or whatever. There wasn't loads of money flying around. And I can remember I, I did a work experience at Wigan. You were down there, Terry O'Connor. And I can remember talking to Dean Bell and he was saying, if you come to Wigan, you're going to get £40 a week. And I thought, I, like I'd done a week that I can't even boil an egg now. I'm 36. At the time, I was like, <laughs> I was a child, really. And then work it in town, I think they said it was like, they give you like a £1,000 on the table and 10 grand over like a certain amount. And and a job, and I just thought, I, I wish back then someone could have said, yeah, but long term, you'd have been better going to, but at the time, I, getting 30 quid back in the day felt like you're a millionaire, wasn't it, weekend yeah, millionaire? Yeah, it so. was, well, I got, we got paid in cash as well, so I, I, again, it's, and all the when you look at all the playing, I am um, like 16 years of age, I ended up making my debut that year as well, so I was 16 when I played for Wigan in a, I think it was a Regal Trophy game, or an early Challenge Cup game, and, I didn't play for a bit after that. I got injured. I, I, I snapped a, an ankle ligament just playing for the Colts. So I got and Ian Gildart, who was going really good as well. and was a fantastic player. He got in the squad at like 17, 18. And then I got back in at just 17 and never really came out of the team again. But that first couple of years, you could play. You could play for the A team on a Friday night for 60 quid. 60 quid a win. 20 quid a loss. You could play for the Colts on a Saturday morning under 19 for 25 quid a win, 15 quid a loss. And then if you were lucky like I was, I could sit on the bench for the first team and get 350 quid. Yeah. I was rolling it. I was rolling in it. It was like, you got paid in cash every single week. So I was going home and my mum was just rifling through this cash and taking as much as she wanted out of my pay slip. But like I say, it was like every week it was, a, you'd, talk, you'd go to the office door, you'd open the door and Mary, who's still involved with the club now, Mary Turner, was there and she'd just like sign you, like you get your pay slip when you get your, your wages in cash. Like for me, someone like that, it was, it was unbelievable. It wasn't like I was digging holes. I was I was turning up and playing rugby. Uh, so it was it was fantastic times. Do, do, do you think now, uh, obviously you hardly trained as a youngster, whereas now I, I feel like some kids get into that system too young, you know, like 11-year-old are in these like, Academy I don't think I hardly. And... I didn't hardly train. Looking back, my I was like say I was a product of my environment at that time. I was. It sounds. I was a street kid. I'd say I spent a lot of time out on the streets. Wasn't that I was um, like say it was just one of those kind of things. You'd be out too late. You'd be chasing things down. You'd be breaking things. And, but worked in not in not in a gang, but just with local lads. Yeah. So getting chased by other gangs. So having problems with lads from the precinct. So I was from Clown and, and the lads from, who went to another school called Solar Precinct. So you had little... So my my training was basically getting into trouble with these lads, recognising a bit of physical stuff, fighting or whatever. It, what it wasn't like... It wasn't guns and knives. It wasn't the Bronx stuff. But getting into scraps, being chased by people, escaping people by running round things, over things, jumping, getting being in the wrong place, getting chased by so my speed and agility came from being able to run away from things that when people were chasing you. So I was out all the time. But on the back of that I was really unfortunate because I had a like I say the, the the sports club that was open not round far from where I was was there to help kids like me, which were kids that had nowhere to go. So it was a like a youth club and um, Clarendon and Juniors, it was like, a, and it was run by a fellow that owned a local um, news agents and a, another gentleman who loved football. Uh, what it, and he had two or three teams, so but we played five a side against local sides, and and it was that. So you'd end up going there and, tra- and not play, training, but you'd end up playing, or you play for two or three hours. You go home and get up in the morning and do the same. So like, did I do any training? I didn't really train, but I never stopped doing things. Like the first real weight session I did was when I was I was I was a professional rugby player when I did my first gym session. Never done a gym session until I was in my in sixteen. And like I said, I was skinny. Give myself some credit, and I was a skinny, tall, tough kid. I was like I said, and that's what got me through a lot of the stuff. But like I said the world's a different place. Professional sports see it differently. People see it as the pathway to making a living, wanting to be successful. I never really, looking back, I never really had any heroes. I was a Manchester United um, fan. 
I watched Salford play a couple of times with Watkins there and Dixon in the back row when I was teacher took me. I went to Man United and watched Gary Burtles and Brian Robson and Norman Whiteside and like I said, those were the, but I never really had any heroes in that sense. I just played sport and ran around. It's a tough era to come in though, isn't it? Late eighties and nineties because you see now on Facebook all the clips that get shared from rugby league. You've got Kelvin Skeretek and Dean Sampson's head off. You've got it just looks like a war zone. Does it? Obviously, they're just like the highlights from them years. But for a sixteen-year-old to be in that first team, seventeen-year-old, it's just. I remember going to Hull KR. I remember going to Hull KR, and it was in the old pitch with a dog track round it. Can't remember what, what the name of it was, but and it was. I think it must have been about yeah, February time or something like that. <laughs> it was like it was cold. There was no grass on the pitch. It was just a mud bath. And I'm sat there. It's only two, two so in those days in the 80s, it's two substitutions and two two subs. Um, so you didn't really get on a lot. The, kid, the team played and you only went on if somebody got injured or you got the last five, ten minutes just to give you some game time. And you think you'd be fighting to get on this field. And I'm watching this game and effectively there's a brawl going on with a ball around it. So there's this big fight just happening. And I'm sat there thinking, Shit, I hope you don't put me on. This is not for me. <laughs> and I got really lucky. I got again, I got really lucky because about that time Granada Sports got involved. Granada TV got involved with rugby league and started showing live games on a Saturday. So they had to tidy it up a little bit. So referees became more accountable. And then foul play became more um more like that the less like, not more, but like less of a thing because the game had to look a little bit less brutal. It yeah. could still be brutal, but it just had to look less like a fight and more like a rugby match. And so you lost a couple of those older heads that had played late seventies, early eighties that were effectively enforcers and were there to to hurt people. So you got a little bit less of that. And that and that for me that worked worked really well because I was an athletic back row forward that wanted to run and wanted to to play the game fast. Who, who was the toughest player when you were when you had to play in them days? Who was the player you looked on the team sheet and thought, I don't fancy playing against Dean Sampson. I don't fancy playing against him. Was there anyone that you looked and thought oh. no, never like that. It was never like looked on I never fancied it. Like I say I had some real good tussles with Sonny Nickel. Uh, that was the early days oh, yeah, yeah. Sonny was a really good, like tough Matt Rower at, um, at St. Helens at the time, played at Bradford. And so you'd look and you'd see these kind of little battles that you had when you were kids and growing up. But I never really had anybody that I never wanted to play against. I always challenged myself to be, I like to play against players that I felt of, of equal standing. And then it was like, how hard can we both go to see who comes out of the side? And again, I was lucky in the sense, I keep saying that word lucky, but I played in a really good side. Came into a side that was moving forward that had had some transition with um, Graham Lowe coming in and just having a little real tinker. So in 1986, I signed for a week with um, Alex McInnes and uh, Colin Clark as coaches. They'd done really well for a couple of years and taken the side to Wembley. But then when I came back to pre season training, they weren't their coaches anymore. They'd been let go. And now Graham Lowe was the coach. And he had a completely different mindset to any English coach had had in a long time. And we had, a, like, 1986, we'd be lost. We lost in the Challenge Cup, games 86-87, but the year after we went on the run and dominated for eight to ten years in that position. Because, and it was all set up by how Graham Lowe had wanted the team to be a little bit different defensively, wanted us to be more ruthless on that side of the ball. And and it affected and then went out and signed lots of good players. Well, I can remember growing up watching Wigan and it felt like no one could beat Wigan. They were just sort of like just head and shoulder. It, it sort of looked like they were like full-time professionals. Everyone else was sort of amateur when you were watching it. Because yeah, in every position, I think you had international at one stage in the mid-90s. Well, that, that that, sort of... well that, was, that was the case. It wasn't a myth. That, that was, <laughs> we weren't full-time, full-time. And I was, I, again, I was at the cusp of that. Like when I joined Wigan, Andy Goodway was a really good trainer. He had a job, but he's a fantastic trainer, a really true professional. Eloy Hanley, like just dedicated to being the best player that he could possibly be. And that was like how he approached the game mentally, physically, 
So like you had players like that that were really hard. There was no short shortcuts, and I was fortunate again because me and Andy Goodway got on really well. Like he's still one of my best friends now, and he sort of took me under his wing. And he was like in his late twenties, but I was this young kid and jumped on the back. And it was everything was really tough. Training was hard. We worked really hard. It was. Training was Tuesday, Thursday uh, nights. If, if you played in the 18, you played Friday night. If you played in the Colts, you played Saturday. If you didn't, you trained with the first team on Saturday morning, you played on Sunday. And then you didn't come back till Tuesday. I started doing um, rehab. So we'd do, we'd do washouts without even knowing what they were. So we'd, have, we'd, we'd play on a Sunday. Then Monday, we'd do a gym session or we'd do a light session when nobody else did. Tuesday, we trained pretty hard because we'd done the Monday session. Wednesday, we'd do a gym session and something else and some skills. And a fella called Bill Hartley, who was then a little bit of conditioner sometimes at Wigan, would do an extra session, speed session. Then we'd turn the team on Thursday. Then would Friday, we'd get, again, it'd be a rehab and really light session and just make some, find somewhere to have a massage. And then Saturday train and play on Sunday or play on Friday night. And I was like 17, 18 and doing these things and just jumping into it. I was going to college at the time. So I'd fallen out of school and not really come out with anything at all. So I'd end up being fortunate enough to be able to go to college because I was earning some money playing rugby. Didn't know what I wanted to do job-wise. Didn't want to join the, what everybody else did, which was join Wigan Metro and be a, in, the, in the council. So I went to college. I did a sports science A-level. but did some GCSEs to start with all levels and went on to do a, some A-levels with sports science and psychology. But I'd say that, that was a long time ago. That was in the early 80s. But I was basically, wasn't full-time, but I was training like I was full-time. Yeah. yeah. And then Phil, Phil Clark jumped on the back of that, and then Andy Farrell jumped on the back of that. So I what Andy Goodway had already started to do. And there was other coaches that were doing something similar. And I'm like, when you look through the history, someone like Vince Corrales, she was doing that kind of similar kind of stuff when he was at St. Helens and Witness. And that's what he, that's why he became so successful because he was willing to do weights and he wanted to put that into the players and they did a little bit of extra work when it wasn't just at training. It wasn't just touch and pass. It had some structure to it around their physical um, physical health and physical well-being. So there, I was like, again, I jumped into that. and So I was that precursor. But in the answer to your question, in the, night, like the early, late 80s and up until like 91, 92, and Wigan were... The only team that was training mostly full time had players that we had a couple of players that had jobs, but they weren't taxing jobs. And not, but most of those players disappeared. By the time you're hitting the early nineties, we we're already full time, and that's why we won every week. Plus, we had all the best players: Andy yeah. Greggs, you know, Sean Edwards, you know, Henry Hadley, you Andy Goodway, Joe Lydon, Steve Hampson's, Sandy Martin, the fire. <laughs> I mean, bringing over Gene Miles. It was, um, yeah, Ian Roberts came and played for an off-season. We got the Iron brothers coming in there. So we, we did all right, yeah. It, was, it wasn't a bad side to play in, if you're thinking about it. Well, it, it was a good side to watch as well, wasn't it? Because even on the outside backs, like having a team where you've got Twigger Marler, Martin Fire, Jason Robbins and Gary Cott, they're the sort of like, if you had to put the best players in every position, I think for a few years, I'd say Wigan probably had their best player in every position, didn't they? want to say... At least one to thirteen, maybe not one to seventeen, but to try and beat a team like that. Do you, do you think it was a good thing when Super League come around to even it up slightly? It didn't even it up. I think it just changed. It as they say, the, the timing took over and everybody sort of caught up a little bit. And we're going to just come to that point where they had to reevaluate themselves, and everybody was a little bit. Even I don't think it was Super League that did that. I think the game had evolved, and everybody was going into a full time environment, and. Then recruitment plays a massive part, but also your development. When you look at the great sides of the last 20, 30 years, it's been about local lads and development of those kids that are a big part. You brought in some key players to make it better. But the St. Helens side that went on in the early part of Super League had a Kieran Koenig and a Paul Wellens. You know, those kind of Chris Joint, those lads that are coming in that system and been part of that. And you added a Paul New Love for or you, you pulled in somebody to make it a, a, a special team. The Bradford side was a little bit different because it was built on 
signing out all the best players. But they had a development program that produced Elliot Whitehead and those kind of kids in Bateman. And there was other kids that came through the Bradford system. They had a good youth system and lots of good players. And then when you look at Leeds, Leeds is, ability, Leeds is success. And to be the side that they've been, or side that they were for as long as they were, was built on the development of players and the yeah. trust that they put into those kids. And then you bring in Jamie Peacock, who's a Leeds lad, or, and he turns it into a completely different animal. But you had Sinfield, who come through their system, you borrow your Maguire's, you in Jones. They're all the kids that have made that club a massive success for 10, 12 years. Uh-huh. So I think that's what happened a little bit. So that recruitment stuff and the development and an understanding of the game where, where, where spread you, it out a little bit. Where, where do you see the game going at the moment? Where, where would you like to see it go? Because when I was young, I can remember watching you captain in England or Great Britain, packed Wembley Stadium against Australia. Whereas at the minute, you just feel like if England played Australia, you'd probably struggle to pack Wembley, wouldn't they? Do you know what I mean? Just being realistic. Where, yeah. where would you like to well, see again, it we, go? We keep, we keep, we keep, again, the world's a different place. And like say the, the platforms that you can watch sport on now are vast. And football is such a dominant part of it and takes such a big slice of it. And the rugby union's turned from being, a, a, well, an amateur game, supposedly, into this full-time monster that it, like dominates the world in that in, in, a, in a sense of very similar code to, to rugby league they've already got an, their, their games built on an international platform so it's hard to break into that when you've only got two or three really good sides internationally so it's it's hard it's I'm like saying the Australian game is such a dominant individual game at the moment the NRL is such a massive animal that they don't outside of the NRL they don't really care I say it's state of origin, it's NRL. Australian playing for your country is important, but it's not as important as playing for your state. It's mm-hmm. not as important as playing in the and so that that's a hard nut to crack. So international mm-hmm. rugby is a hard nut to crack when you've only got New Zealand and Australia and Great Britain. France are okay. Samoa are okay. They're not sides that are gonna put a big statement out of that. They're gonna jump in now and again and play all right such as Tonga and Samoa have done and Fiji have done. But, but ultimately like you've got three teams that are competing all the time. So it's a tough it's a tough platform to break. Um my views on game in this country is that we've got to stop living in the past. So you, you can't have tradition. You can't have tradition and change. You've got to let go. You've got to let go of one and got and grow another thing. So if you want change and want that game to keep the pace, we've got to get rid of promotion and relegation. Got to understand um, how we develop teams in, in key areas. And that's not losing other teams, but recognizing again that the game's not strong enough to be on that, the old model of having three divisions. If you're no good in the top division, you go into the second division. If you're no good in the second division, you go into the third. If you're good in the third, you go into the second. That doesn't work because of the way money flows and the way that kids play sport nowadays. They say you're never really going to break that top four or five and you're just going to end up keep in a cycle of bankruptcy and insolvency down the bottom end. So you've got to get rid of that fight in a way. And I don't think you make more teams. I don't think you make less. Everybody talks about trying to strengthen it by, you see, if we go down to Super League only having 10 teams and in two years' time we'll talk about Super League having eight teams because two of those teams aren't good enough. Then we'll talk about, then all of a sudden you've not got a game anymore. Some teams are going to get beat and some teams, but you give them a chance. So if you go to 14, 16 teams and nobody at the top wants to hear that because they don't want their slice of the cake cutting into a 16th. They want it to be um, a 12th or a 10th or they want to keep as much of that revenue as they can. But you get more teams, you don't have promotion relegation, you can work on developing your youngsters through that pathway. You, you keep it so that you're not panicking about the team you select this year and finishing last because you might get two or three really good players that have become a spine of your side that go on and next year you win another six, seven games and you finish it 10th and not 14th. And a year after that, those players could be in their early 20s, their 20s. Plus then you don't get a lot of wastage at the bottom for kids that are 19 have got nowhere to play. You give them some, somewhere to play. But that's again. That's there's a lot of there's a lot of politics involved in most sports, and nobody's got its own issues and its own 
solve problems with people fighting constantly about wanting what they want and not what they're good for the game. Well, it, like you said about the air teams and things like that, I, I I think it went downhill slightly when they got rid of the air teams. I think an air team's probably better than you. I know I'm, I'm an idiot. I don't know that much about it, but I feel like an air team, because there's some players peak at different times, don't they? Well, basically now, if you get to 19, you're no good. You're going back to amateur. Most lads don't play anymore because they give up on the professional dream or whatever. Whereas that second team, you've got people like Jamie Peacock, they would have never made it without an air no. team. Without going off somewhere else and playing as well, so Jamie goes off and plays somewhere else. So yeah, I think is that having having a structure where players can show their worth and develop a little bit later. I think we put too much stock, and this goes back to the start of that too much stock of what's happened to the game with academies. We're trying to put it into a skill system, and our skill system doesn't doesn't work in that development of um, physical and contact sport. So you're finishing your skill system probably at like coming out of college at 18 and going to university and there's no real rugby development beyond that so if we can put you in a college environment up from 16 to 18 so that's our academy we can play you under 19s up to the age i might be able to keep you on a little bit longer for one year but you don't you play with the team of the first team but you've got somewhere to play if you're at the young end but once you drop, jump out of college and go to university there's nowhere for you to play at the club unless you you're a full-time player and you can't go to university with a full-time player. So we get lost in that fact the way we're, we're categorising kids 16 when it's time to academy. If they stay in academy for two years, we give them a little bit of education, train them up and put them full-time. And then if they're good enough, they go on and play. But if they're not good enough and they buy that stage, they're gone. Yeah. They disappear. And they, don't, and they don't go back and play in the League One and they don't go back and play. Some of the good ones do, but they just jump around while they find something else because they can't earn enough money. And then they disappear. We've got a whole band of players that are just lost to the game. That they've got no amateur clubs to go to because they're not. There's not enough of them out there, or the quality in the amateur game is not high enough, and the refereeing's not good enough, and the funding's not great. So it's it's a really catch twenty two of how you find a way of finding a way of keeping those that age group from eighteen through to twenty four. Because, like, say, at 24, I think it's the Brady. That, like, say, I think if, when you look at the Super Bowl this year and you look at the Brady phenomenon, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. Yeah. With the rings he's played. He comes out of university at 23 years of age and gets drafted at 23 years of age. At 23 years of age, people still don't think he's good enough because he goes in and he doesn't get drafted until 109th in the draft. That's basically he's, he's doing it for free. And there's no money at that end. Somebody just picked him up as a quarterback to fill in that fourth choice. As he goes into that, the professional game suits him. College game didn't suit him. Professional game suits him. All of a sudden, he develops into a phenomenon. But that, that, that's every what team, every team he plays, that's what we're missing. We're missing yeah. that kind of ability. But because of the way professional sport works in in America and the college system, you can't. You can jump out of it, but Ultimately, you have to play and go to college, and you come out of college at twenty-three, not at twenty. So it's like university, and then you get turned into a professional um, NFL player. And there are exceptions, I know that, but on a whole, the whole system is built on getting kids to an age of maturity and maturation that can get them ready for physical contact sports, and they get good coaching and good training within the college systems that can help them develop that. But again, we're, we're talking about something that needs that needs them big fix in yeah. this country more than anything else. And it's like say, I think promotion relegation is the worst thing. And and it's not it's not that it wasn't good in the past, and it's not oh this is our tradition, it, but it's the past. You can't run a professional sport, and we're not football, so you can't think about that up and down. And football still has its own struggles. And then what rugby union have just done now has been coming for the last fifteen years, which is they they've decided that they're not going to have promotion relegation this year just to see how it looks. But I don't think they'll ever go back to promotion relegation. I think they'll stay at a close shop for the Premiership. They'll develop the team that's in there. If you're good enough and you can find the ground and you can show that you've got the ability to be able to, to take the next step and be a Premiership tied, then your application will be considered and you'll be put in. Nobody will leave unless they can't fulfil their side of the bargain as well. So I think that's what you need to go to. 
I, I, in rugby league now, we always talk about, oh, we're trying to grow the game. And then Super League had an opportunity to put someone in. Loads of people applied. And they went with Lee. Lee seemed like a great club coach, John Duffy's class bloke, guy that runs his team, dead passionate. But you feel like you had the opportunity there. Give it to a Gator, give it to a Cumbrian team, give it to a Lund. You know what I mean? It felt like, oh, York big city York, just give them a go at it. It just felt like that was an opportunity just, just to give someone a chance for that year. And like you said, they might only do it for a year, but to try and grow the game slightly, I just felt like that was an opportunity wasted. Well, that's one way. Look, if you're if you're from Lee or a Lee fan, it's not been wasted, is it? No, that's what I mean. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. And, and Derek Bowman is a ball that you want, like you say, he's a lunatic, and he's up, but you want him involved in the game at top end because he, wants, he puts his money where his mouth is. And he's put plenty of cash into Lee. He's bought in players. He wants them to be successful. But like, yeah, again, but there's a the flip side of it. So, how are we going to make the game better by having Lee, Wigan, Warrington, St. Helens all within a, a really tight knit part of the country? Lee thinks so as well because everybody wants to. Lee fans want to watch Lee and they want to be successful. It's a, it's not an easy job to do. It's not. So I remember Morris Lindsay getting dragged over the coals when he wanted to regionalise and he tried to do it up in Cumbria and he tried to get the Cumbrian side to amalgamate. He tried to do it in um, Calder with Wakefield and Castleford and Featherston. I mean, he's tried to pull those and everybody was like, not a chance. I can't stand those Janets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's one of those kind of tough, it's a tough job to do, but that's what leadership's about. Leadership, uh, that rugby league needs somebody that's going to go, this is the plan, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to stick to. Not just changing the format of the way the game looks or saying, like, we're going to have a Super 8 or we're going to have a playoff system or we're going to have one team or one team. We're going to have a, it's going to be like, this is how we're going to do it and how we're going to do it. For five. And I think they had that. I think the, the hardest thing that, and I've heard this said a lot, um, the licensing system, and everybody said the licensing system didn't work. It, the licensing system works. The principle works. How you apply that is what failed. And like I say, if we if we carry on, and they're going to end up going back to it now because they recognise when they look back that actually, yeah, having a licensing system, having a system where you look at everybody's ability to fulfil their role within the criteria of being a Super League side needs to be applied from the ground, from their academy, from the development of players, from their work in the community, from their investment in the top team. They, those need to be quite um, open-ended and you be able to, you need to be able to see them. Do, do you think the salary cap works? Because I'm one of them. I, I would like to just say someone from Saudi Arabia say, I want to buy a sports team. They always buy football teams. It, just say some guy from Dubai, multi-billionaire, comes to Gateshead, and says, Dennis, want to put you on 500 grand a year, he's 10 million, go and buy the best rugby league team in the world. I, 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 I don't personally think that would be a bad thing for the game. It's like Kukash was at Salford. I think you have to have three or four of them in Super League. I think it would have made it a better spectacle, whereas everyone's like, oh, you've got to keep the salary cap, whereas a lot of Super League clubs aren't even getting to that salary cap. I don't think it makes that much of a difference. I think the, biggest, the biggest problem, again, is you've got, you've got human traits within every club. And the salary cap is there to protect you, not just to hinder you. So you can spend, you can spend ten million quid. If you've not got it though, then you're going to go broke, and you're going to fall to fall on the ground. You can project forward that you're going to get twelve thousand people watching you if you buy these players, and nobody comes. Yeah. So you spent the money on the players, and nobody comes to watch us, and you go broke. And you then all of a sudden you go from being, you have four teams, four teams with multi-billionaire owners, and nobody else around. Right, so there's no that's, responses that's, right? like I, when they leave, you're left in limbo. Well, it's not. It's not even when they leave. They might want their clubs. They might end up like with like a Scottish system, where you've got Celtic and Rangers and the rest that are just like semi pros against two pro pro sides. It's a it, again. It's yeah. I'd love the game to be able to. Like, so that's where I think someone like Dave Bowman. He, you can't. Give him an opportunity if his plan works and it looks like he's, he's got a really good stadium, he's got a good, he's got a really good business. He wants to put money into the sport, into his team. 
don't just after one year don't kick him out of the competition because he's not got it right that year give him a bit of time again. Now, yeah. would this wouldn't have been successful when I was there and when I say successful I know everybody would have wanted a little bit more out of it like I said I wanted to win a witness but without the licensing system we would have failed in that first year because it was just too hard it was too hard for to get players it was too hard to develop players in a year well, not even a year because we got the license in the November. The players came out of contract, so I I couldn't sign anybody until we definitely got the license. When pre season started, all the players were signed up for all of the clubs by that stage. So then you end up picking up the ones that nobody wants. Yeah. So you end up running into you end up running into February by the time the start of the season, and you've had eight weeks, ten weeks with some players that you've just signed that have been kicked out of other clubs that don't. Or you've still got the championship team you've got. And you're going into a competition that's pretty ruthless. You're not going to win. So no, you need no. that time. So by year year one, we finished bottom one points difference. Year two, we jumped up two places. Year three, we were in the top 10 out of 14 teams. And then it changed it again. So our development was there to see. And it wasn't about... And I was starting to find players that wanted to come. I was starting to... Our recruitment policy was working overseas. It was working in this country. Our development programme was bringing on 17, 18 year olds that were then getting to it, 19, 20, 21, that were good squad players. So our squad looked stronger with local kids, our developed players. Our top squad looked better because I was, I was, it was more attractive. We had to we could recruit a little bit different. And that's when you brought in Kevin Brown and Danny Tickle. I brought Chris Houston over and I got Corey Thompson to come over from Australia. And so, and Reese Hanbury stayed on with us instead of going back to Australia. So your development and your recruitment was working because people could see that. And then we jumped into the top eight in the playoffs. And then we changed the rules again. And then it was about survival. So all those kids that I was developing, I had to push to one side. And I had to spend all my money on trying to stay in that league. And then you lose the kids or you lose some of the players, you get injured, your squad tightens up. And you're frightened every week about not, not winning you start to lose and then it's hard to break that cycle and then nobody wants to come. You've lost your development program in place because of that fear. It, it Well, you, you look at Super League, the coaches and things, they never seem uh, to last long. They're apart from the top three coaches, maybe in the top three teams, the other coaches come in a uh, professional environment, the assistant coach, then the head coach, and then you never see them. They always seem to be lost to the game. Whereas, like in football, they always seem to get jobs here, there, and everywhere. Whereas in pro- professional rugby league, I always feel a bit sorry. I was talking to Lee Breeze, nice little Lee Breeze. If I was him, I would stay at that like assistant coach level or below because you'll always have a job. As soon as you take that chance, it go a little bit higher. You do, you, you, you jump up, and it's like, again, it's what everybody wants to be in charge and they want to implement changes and you want to be the one that is a focal point and I think that is a problem within but that, that's most professional sports I know there's a cycle in, in football but there's lots of work in football there's lots of jobs and there's lots of players around the world but because it's so parochial rugby league as well so for example so I, I'm from Salford I played all my career at Wigan I went to the um, Auckland Warriors and then I came back to Wigan yeah I worked as Wigan as head coach or assistant coach for three years. I was the head coach for two years. I left um, when Ian Millwall took over um, and I became his assistant. I went and worked in rugby union. I spent six years at Gloucester. I came back and everybody thought that I'd been out of the game too long to be able to take a head coach's job. Mm-hmm. It's like, I've been coaching. I've been working. Ass off. I've been getting qualified. I've been developing my coaching skills. I've been developing every aspect of my, my ability to be able to teach and to be able to coach a team and develop individuals. And so that was the view that from inside the game. But I must have lost touch. I've, I've been doing this since I was like, say, since I was 11 in some ways. And so just because I was doing something different for six years, I'd lost touch. So it became, but I, took, I jumped back in because I wanted to get back into the league, because I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to develop a team. And then it's, you get tired with that brush and nobody really, for the first two years, a lot of the supporters that witnessed didn't take to me because I was a Wigan player. i have been at Gloucester for six years. I hadn't been anywhere near Wigan for God knows how long. I was a professional coach 
who said oh, I wanted that but that was and that ends up with the view so you fall out if you're an English player and you fall out and you've been a successful English player or you've worked with a certain team for so long those fans don't like you because of that so like that becomes a real and, and, and owners don't want to upset the fans owners don't want to put somebody in charge they don't think they'll get a boost from it so yeah. that and I don't think in, I don't think in football they care that much because like most of the ownership is either like you say Saudi Arabian Asian <laughs> so they just want to put somebody in charge who they think is going to be able to do the job for them it, it's weird in rugby league as well how they still look down on rugby union you know like oh he's been to rugby union he must have got worse and I'm one and I, I played a bit of both and I think both codes can learn off each other on loads of aspects but I feel like rugby union's more willing to learn so they're like oh bring a rugby league coach in to do defence or bring a whereas I feel like in rugby league it's still a bit close off like you said you went there for six years there'll be things you picked up in rugby union that you probably thought I'm going to use that in rugby league and vice versa the game's easier Coaching the game, coaching this game is easy. Tactics, tactical, technical, and tactical is easy. Developing people, working with people, finding ways to make people better. That's the skill. I only became a proper coach when I went to Gloucester. I only spent time on my coach, and I only spent real time on um, in a classroom working through coaching aspects when I was at Gloucester. Up until that point, it had been most of the grindstone trying to work my way through like winning games. So, and this rugby union, rugby league, I'm, I, I, I don't know where it came from. We feel that they, like I said, rugby union started off a little bit later. So they came to professional sportsmen. They had a hierarchy of highly educated people that went, let's see what he knows. Let's see what he knows. And that was at the time it was Phil Larda. Then it ended up being Sean Edwards and... Joe Lydon and now Andy Farrell. Like, these lads have played the game as well. So, so like Faz had played for England when he started coaching rugby. I never coached rugby league, so he'd been a he'd been a rugby union player for about five years before he started doing any coaching at Saracens. So it's not like he's it's that's a big step for him anyway. But you, you never lost the accent though, like Andy, did you? <laughs> I, I've seen Andy Farrell on the telly now, and I, I always think that is definitely not his voice when he played for Wigan. Well, I don't know. well, he was only a kid when he played there. What did I say? And he's from Wigan. And as you as you grow and you get experience, certain things change. I've never seen myself with an accent because my voice is that kind of monotone kind of. The kids call it traffic. My kid, my voice is just like traffic. No, there's no pitch in it whatsoever. And that comes from getting getting hit in the throat continuously. That's what my voice sounds like. This. I, I, how did you struggle when you finished, Dennis? Did you did you like? I'm one of them. It sometimes gets to a Saturday now, and you're like. Not lost, but you, you think, oh, I used to play. And it, there's just certain times you think, oh, I wouldn't mind playing. Sometimes when you've had a drink and there's a good game on no. the telly and you think, oh, I wouldn't mind playing. But, uh, I missed, I probably, well, that's the one thing when I reflect back, I should have probably, had, I carried on, I had a two-year contract to play with Wigan when I started coaching. What came up, there were salary cap issues there. And it was that kind of thing. I was 32 going to 33. I'd had some injuries. I was... Change, the game was changing a little bit. Substitutions were going up. I worked out how to. I was going to adapt. I was going to move from being a back rower into a front rower. So I was working on my game to get better. And it just this opportunity to go into the coaching and look after Wigan's academy and look after some of their kids came about. It was always something that I thought about doing and worked out. I'd, I'd, I'd done a, a diploma at Newcastle University in sports psychology, and I'd done couple of older coaching aspects and the badges leading up to there and it, but it was just something that jumped on me and I wish I'd have not taken it now at that stage really. I wish yeah. I'd have carried on playing because trying to get back into playing is something that you can't do once you step out going back at the level that I'd wanted to play at you can't jump back in it's very rare I'd like say and, and Gareth Ellis did it last year and Jamie Peacock tried it. but it's never it's not the same it's not it wouldn't have been the same and maybe carried on playing for a couple more years. But again, I I just fell into that coaching role really easily and, and I'm, I can hold my hands up here and to be honest with you as well. Like I said, I'm not saying there's not been times when I've been a bit stressed and worked like, well, what's next? Where do I go? But I've been really fortunate. I, mean, I walked out of a team and took over a team at the club that I've been there playing at. I worked with the first team as well. The hardest part I ever had was that that first year out, 
assisting the first team with um, Stuart Raper and doing some work with the first team when I felt I should still be playing. But once I got once I got my kids playing and once I got the team that I was coaching moving forward, the under 18s, and then looking at recruiting and development and talking to parents and talking to players about being involved in Wigan's Academy and signing contracts and being and looking at their future. I've been excited every day. I've never lost a changing rooms. I've had a changing room every single I say this lockdown has been the first time since I was 13, 14, I haven't been involved in sport at the weekend. So it's probably yeah. the same for everyone else, I say. And I, it's been no longer, I might have gone away on holiday for a couple of weeks and had two weekends off, but not nine months off away from sport and not been involved in sport. And I've never lost a changing rooms. I've always had that buzz. I've always had that feel every weekend. I have a coach in the team or being a director of rugby or being involved in the team all the way through from finishing 20 years ago. Well, you always feel so, there's a lot of lads in rugby league don't have that opportunity like you because there's only a few jobs in, in coaching in rugby league yeah. for how many players. I'm again, I, again, I'm a look at it. Again, everybody looks at it and everybody thinks that. And it's not. It's not. It's an, it seems like an easy pathway, but it's not because I made a choice early on that I might, and this is my career. I'm a career coach. So I went and educated myself. I went and did. So like I've got um I've got a degree, I've got a degree in sports coaching, elite sports coaching. I've got a level four um Sport England rugby league coaching badge. I've got a level five IFU coaching badge. I've got a degree in sports coaching from Loughborough University for the rugby union coaching badge I did. It took me two years. I've got on countless courses. So I'm constantly upgrading my skill level to be this be my job. A lot of people just jump into it and think because they're a good player, they can be a good coach. And then when it ends, they've not really got something on their CV. Like I've been coaching now for 20 years. And that's how like I've been coaching longer than I was playing. Just saying that long ago, does it? That's what I mean. Like it, it, well, it seems bizarre when well, you look back because time just passes on, isn't it? And that, that yeah, like, it just it moves on really quickly. Like you say, you turn around. And your children are not going to school anymore. They're, they're going to work. It's that kind of change in, in focus. And I think rugby league's better at that now than the were. It's like they're dropping hints to players that are maybe getting to their late 20s saying, what, what are you going to do after this? Because rugby league players can't just sit in the house and say, oh, I'm going to have a couple of years to decide what I'm going to do. It's not like football where they're going to have to make that decision pretty much as they stop playing, isn't it? For the majority, unless you're on like big oh, wages. Rugby. Well, it's not like, say, it's less than 1% in rugby league. That, and even then, they don't earn enough money. I mean, you've got to work. Everybody's got to work. Like, say, footballers who come out and they'll spend money because if they've got it, they'll spend it. So they, unless they're smart and they invest well or they do certain things right, then they're going to have to work. So everybody's got to find that point where they're, they're either working and investing their own money and so they've got a, a business or they've got property or they've got something else going. I thought they've earned that, save that much money that somebody else invested for them. But everybody, I mean, and most so in, outside of those elite sports that are generating that kind of wage is, like I say, rugby league, it'd be, it'd be very few English-based players I say you might end up with a few quid in the bank when you finish at 30 on, but you've got 50 more years. Yeah. You know what you're going to do for 50 years. And having a purpose and what you want to see as it gives you a chance to do things that you might not have been able to do because you've got, got good at sport. So don't just sit in playing Xbox and then go and play on a weekend or go out and train in the day. Like I say, find out what you want to do long term. What's your passion? If you it's passion sport, then upskill yourself, do some education, get on some pathway in physiotherapy, whether it be psychology, and use your sport to develop that. They're, they're the things that we keep pushing towards. And if not, then go take an electrician course. Like a number of kids that I had at their witness did bricklaying courses, did elect electrical courses, now a couple of them off working for companies and electricians. And so they're having, they've, they've, they've enjoyed that part of their life. They've used earning money and playing sport while they got educated to do something else and stepped into that. I think that's what we've got to, got to all really emphasise that this could end tomorrow, yeah. or you might get yeah. to you might get to your thirties. But the the number of people that stay in the sport and develop and have a longevity in the sport after you finish playing 
is a minor percent. But we always look at those people and think that's what I want to be. I want to, yeah. I want to coach Wigan. I want to be like Sean Wayne and go through that. And I want to, and I want to be a physiotherapist. And I want to, well, you know yourself. I want to be, I want to be a physio. I want to be a sports conditioner. I want to stay in rugby league. It, it's hard work. There's millions of people out there thinking the same thing. It's like um, you get the choice. I used to have thousands of people every year apply for uh, a job as a, a um, conditioner, uh, a witness. Even though I had one, I'd still get two or three thousand applicants from kids that had fell out of university or done something else, thinking this was the next big step for them. And it's there's a lot of it's a lot of work out there, but not so much in professional sports. Well, how, how do you think you would have lasted when you were playing with social media? Do you think you would have? Do you think that, like, I remember talking to Jason Robinson. He said a lot of players wouldn't have had a career if social media was around in the mid nineties <laughs> because of Munda Club and stuff like that. Do you think you would have been one that had adapted to? Because you see players now in all sport, it's like gym session, top off, just been to the gym, beach session, something like that. Do you th- do you think you'd have adapted to it or would you just be one of those people like a Johnny Wilkinson just sort of ignored it? Because it affects a lot of players now. Like, the amount of people I talk to that are well-known and they read the negative comments and they always think, why don't you just ignore it? And they said, you just can't. So there'd be a thousand positive and then one just saying, oh, you're a fat wanker. And they just said, that's the one you're zooming on. Do you think you'd well, have embraced that's, again, it? That's, that's the psychology of what social media does. It doesn't. Nobody wants to believe all the other stuff. They, they want to be nice because... The, um, I'd have adapted, yeah. I'd have caught with it. Like, I think I was a pretty adaptive kind of person. So I adapted to my environment. When we, as the game moved from being that early, mid-80s into the 90s, into a full-time environment, into, like say, I'm a, working to be an elite sport, going and working in Australia and playing and uh, living in New Zealand, working in rugby. It's a, I've, Everything's about being a, the ability to adapt and not take yourself too seriously. But... I'm not a fan. Of, I'm not. I don't. I'm not on social media. Like I say, very rarely. We've contacted each other through LinkedIn, and I, I should use that more than I do. I'm on LinkedIn, but I very rarely check it. Every now and again, I do. It's like there's millions of things pop up on it. I don't know how to set it so that notifications come through and I get notified by it. So my phone, like I say, technophobe. My phone doesn't beep every time something comes through. So then every now and again, I check things, and it's like I'm in about three WhatsApp groups for, and there's about a million messages on there and I'm thinking oh shit I should have replied to that last week so it's I'm more of a make contact talk to people and see what happens on the back of it but would I have adapted to social media yeah I don't think I I don't think it would have been something that I'd have enjoyed but that's me now but if I'd have been stuck in the middle of it and that would have been the way I live my life like kids are nowadays so you don't go anywhere without a phone I remember sitting on the bus at Wigan and somebody pulling out an iPad uh, not an iPad an, I- um, an iPod and it's like this one I can get 25,000 songs on this yeah it's like Jesus and then you know, couldn't ring anybody or do anything and that was the unbelievable piece of kit and that was like say that would have been my late 80s early 90s I think I've still got one in the drawer when I ended up buying one this old model of, a, of an of an iPod. Well, that's it's... what happened in the change rooms, wasn't it? That used to be a nightmare because you'd have one ghetto blaster and whoever brought the songs, <laughs> if you didn't like the songs, you're like, fuck, I don't fancy playing with reggae in the well, background. I was, talk- I, was, I, was, I was talking to my kids and it's like, I had a, I had a car and I had a six loader CD fitted in the back of it. I thought I had more music than I was ever going to use. I bought yeah. six CDs in the back of the car I can listen to. How, how trendy am I? Now I've got 45,000 songs <laughs> all Wi-Fi into the music system. And even sometimes that's not enough because the kids are going, oh, it's rubbish, it's all, there's nothing on it. But God, I was happy with six CDs in the back listening to them constantly. Do you mind that as a coach, just say you've got players and they put music on? Because I, I, I've played under coaches. I remember trying to put a Top Gun CD on. This is up in Scotland. The guy was dead old school. He nearly booted it through the window. Because he was just like, we don't listen to music before we go out. And I was like, all right, sorry, I have to bring earphones. Whereas other coaches like, yeah, you can put music on. We, are you one of them a bit like, oh, just whatever works for you lot? Or are you music yeah, off? It, 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 everybody, t- no, because old school stuff is not like, say, everybody. I don't coach players to be like me because I was a bit weirdo as well. You know what I mean? So, like, 
I coach players, like say, so you use the ability to manipulate the group, find out what the group wants, how what, and kids are different. And that I love being involved in coaching. I love being involved in sport because it keeps you young. So you have to adapt. I mean, like the, the next five, the game's different now than it was five years ago because now those those what lads that were 19, 25 years ago are now in the mid twenties and some have got girlfriends and kids. So they've changed. And now this new group of 18, 19 year olds are excited. They've got different ways of doing things because they're just coming out of school and they're so it's a little bit different again. So everybody's got to adapt. When those 18, 19 year old kids turn into 26, 27 year olds, they'll look back and think, well, I thought I was trendy and cool, but this new group think that they're old at 26, 27 years of age. So I must feel like I'm ancient when I'm in the 50s. So it's that kind of constantly looking at those kids and what they want to do. And I'm not, like I say, that sport went through that transition where you had that bloke who screamed and shouted at you and locked you in a room. So you come out spitting nails. That The game's different now. Everybody, the kids are different. They don't want that anymore. That, that, that's, I think a good coach treats everyone slightly different. Like you say, if, if they've got to listen to music to play well, just let them put their earphones on, play music. And I, I can remember when you were younger, if someone had a pair of red boots on, it was basically, he better be good for wearing red boots. Whereas now people have got mohawks, full sleeve tattoos. And, and that's in the space of like 12 years, 13 years. So that how things have changed, how people's perceptions have changed. And that old school, I've had coaches like that, where the borderline wanting to punch you in the face at half time, you're like, that's just not helping anyone, is it really? You've, you've got a small time well, to put a bit of information probably helping, in. It's probably helping them. That's what it's helping. But they don't have to play. So it's helping them feel like they've done the right thing. I told him what to do and he just didn't do it. That's not coaching, <laughs> is it? <laughs> that's sticking up for yourself. That's sticking up for yourself. But that, again, there's a place and a time for everything. But again, it's that, treat everybody as an individual. You can have some common goals and you can have a common plan. But within that, you've got, in the team at the time, you've got 17 different people with all different needs and wants and problems. Outside of that, you've got another group of people, 10 of them, that you need to keep happy because you need them to go into the team because you know you're going to lose some of those players. But they already want to be in the team. So how do you keep them motivated when you're not picking them? Because you know you're going to have to pick them eventually. Not sure when. Because yeah. of injuries and our form, but you need to keep that group. So you have to treat that group a little bit differently. God, they, they disappear. So it's that constant battle with dealing with people. Well, I, I think the worst thing we had when we were younger was if you didn't get picked, or if you were eighteenth man, you went in this group called the plasticine group. And they're the ones that weren't picked, and they would just practice passing and core skills or something like that. It was borderline like a special needs group. And I think in rugby league, that was the worst thing. You know, like you had your squad there training for the match and then you maybe have four or five people that were just like, you You just go and practice catching bombs or passing a ball. I think if they get rid of the plasticine group, I think that'll help a lot of people who are uh, keeping <laughs> occupied or interested. Uh, everybody, I see, it's trying to work on rotation, putting where people fit within your group. But you're always going to have people that fall out and you're always going to have people that, feel that they should be in the side when they're not. So it's that, that's just the skill. The skill that's involved is knowing that you got to keep people motivated. And I, well, if you, depending on what size you squad, and the old school stuff is, like say, if you've done something wrong or you didn't do something that I thought was worthwhile if you've been in the team or good for the team, and I blow your legs off in a training, in a, in a team meeting or in front of all the players by just giving it to you. But then I've got to take you outside. I've got to screw your legs back in because I need you to play next week because I've got no other yeah. players. So how do you work that out? And it's, that's where you become how you win the team, how you lose the team, how you can keep that level of not criticism but constructive um, development in place where a positive mindset and a, a mindset where telling you you've done something wrong is not going to make you feel really bad. Telling you you've done something really well is not going to make you too big-headed. So it's that constant battle with trying to motivate you to keep wanting to improve on each performance, whether it be a really good performance or a really poor performance. I, I think as well, rugby league coaches have the hardest job in the fact that I used to like rugby league raw, I used to like watching that programme. The fact that if Alex Ferguson just said Man United's getting, we're getting beat 3 0, no one can get to him. He's got security either side of him. If you're in the stand, 
and just say your team's doing badly. I love the fact that you've got like 70 year old women saying, Dennis, sort this out, they're playing terrible, but right in your ear. Like I used to love that on the Rugby League wow. role. You don't have that same safety net that you've got to walk through the people. <laughs> No, you go into town, it's like, see, you're not, you're not multi-millionaires and live out of the way. You live apart from people that you live in the middle of the people that you're, whose team you're all in charge of. I say that the best comment ever is always like um, walking through town and somebody stopping you and saying, don't forget to win, Dennis. I'll say, thanks for that. I remember that one. <laughs> I'll tell the lads. It's, it's, uh, uh, how are you going to play today? Oh, we're going to be rubbish. Really? Why are you saying that? Well, if I said we're going to play well, you're going all a bit overconfident. So you can't win when you go back with the conversation. Anyway, no, well, you're in Tesco, people bumping a trolley into you because you dropped a ball or something like that. And like you say, there's nothing worse <laughs> when you played, where if you dropped a high kick, people say, don't drop that kick. You're like, oh, geez, I, I didn't know what I was meant to do there. You know what I mean? Uh, like yeah, yeah. that useless information that people relate to you. Well, that's that's what fans are. And fans, the escapism when I got a little long time ago is that. People don't, like everybody's an expert because they live next door to it. But you've got to give them that. They, they, that's their escape. Once a week, they want to come and watch their team and they want to come and watch their team win and they want to watch their team put lots of effort in. So first and foremost, you've got to get a team that gives you effort so that when you go, when those supporters come to you, oh, oh he's he's not very good, but he tries hard, don't he? You can yeah. live with that. You can live with the fact that so everybody's got to be able to put a maximum amount of effort for the team for the club for the t- for the shirts on that side of it so that's what you've got to constantly push at then if you get good players and you get better then they can but that's their escape those plants might have been working in Tesco's they might have been digging holes all week they might have had been under the ground laying cables they might I mean they might have been shoving concrete or working um, in an office somewhere like, whatever it is that once a week, that's their escape. And they can become experts because they love it, they've seen it all their lives. So they know what that is. You've got to let them have that. So you've got to step away from that feeling um, criticised. Again, it's a social media. You've got to step away from feeling criticised. My job is, this is what I do, this is my job. And I so, say, like, I know what I'm doing. Your job is, whatever your job is, but you love this sport and you pay for it and you and it gives you an escape so you can have an opinion that's what sport is everybody's got an opinion I've got an opinion on football got an opinion on football basketball American football cricket oh you should do that but I've got an opinion on it because I watch it and I like it and I think that I know what I'm talking about I'm a million miles away from what someone like Michael Vaughan talks about who's captain England <laughs> it's, a, it's been a coach it's that kind of thing isn't it? I, I, I think the favourite people and every rugby league club's got one amateur to professional, that person that has like five or six pints, and it's like they've got Tourette's, and all the shout is get him on side, isn't it? And that's that's the only shout they have. Like I used to stand behind one at White, and you're like, is that all you're going to shout? And it was the same every week, no matter what the ref was. There's always them people, isn't there? Always high, or they have the same chance, don't you? If you see them in the crowd each week, that's their escape. Yeah, that's their yeah. love for the game, and you've got to, you've got to really appreciate that's what gives them their buzz, and if that's what we're there for, that's what we're there for. No, no, but I've, I've, I've taken up enough of your time, Dennis, but uh, geez for coming on and hopefully uh, get back playing and stuff like that because there's nothing well, else to Hopefully we're, 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 we're back on right the track. Hopefully by the middle of March, everything will be back in. Then hopefully we can get fans back ASAP. I like say we're not really not really sure, but I'm hopeful that before you know it, we'll have we'll have some fans back in the grounds watching watching sport in general and, uh, and especially rugby league. But I say hopefully we can get this year up and running, get it moving, get some sport back on the TV and get people enjoying rugby league again. And if Gates had a short, you could be play coach. That would be a story, wouldn't it, to come out? Just just, just be hands. First yards in your head. That's what this old fellow used to say when we used to play. Just come on and give it hands. <laughs> Easy, Peter. Ah, yeah. Cheers, Dennis. You're very welcome, mate. No problem. Cheers,